I'm going to talk about um, alternative Tier 2 SSROs that acknowledge non-contaminant effects, um, along with my co-presenter, uh, Gladys Stevenson. I've been working in the um, Ecotox field for the last 20 years as a statistician. I was a technical contributor to the CCME SSD document that several of you referred to, as well as some of the Environment Canada biological test methods and uh, specifically the guidance that's out there for collecting soils for biological toxicity testing. There are several ways to uh, go to a site and assess whether there's uh, something bad happening and uh, the first one is a simple comparison of PHCs to the Tier 1 guideline. Uh, the second approach is to uh, use Tier 2 guidelines which allow for limited modifications on a site-specific basis, and those limited modifications are discussed in um, CCME 2006 as the precursor to the Alberta Environment uh, 2010 document, and then it's subsequently discussed in the Administrative Environment document of 2011. Although modifications are possible for Tier 2 guidelines, no modifications are possible for the soil contact guideline which is the primary driver of most of the guidelines because the soil contact guideline is the most sensitive. What we're going to be talking about today is a way to modify the soil contact guideline based on site specific attributes. Um, and Gladys has already mentioned that Alberta Environment does talk about or has a provision for modifying those um, tier two numbers but there's no process. So we've developed a process to do that, and I'm going to talk about it today. Um, there are many challenges to deriving uh, a Tier 2 SSRO, and, and when Gladys mentioned that, that um, I was uh, interested in doing this work, she was right, but I also didn't tell her that I was quite skeptical that it would have a positive conclusion. Um, and that's based on t over 20 years of doing uh, data, working with data in this field. And I was pleasantly surprised at the end uh, with the results that I got. Some of the challenges are the, um, that um, you have to choose toxicity test species that are representative of the received environment. You have to reconcile different lines of ecotoxicological evidence and, and they can be contradictory. And the next four are exactly what my um, uh, approach deals with. It deals with the presence of non-contaminant factors that can elicit a response. Uh, as Gladys mentioned, it's maybe not a toxic response, but it is still a response and it can be confounded with a toxic response. Um, another challenge is the strong relationship between and among COPCs and non-COPCs that wreaks havoc with any statistical tools and uh, as well as making inferences and statements. I'm going to, um, or another challenge is describing the relationship between COPCs, the non-COPCs and the observed toxicity. How do you do that simultaneously? And the, the fourth issue, or the fourth um, challenge, is the cost of establishing generally applicable dose responses that also acknowledge non-contaminants. And hopefully, that'll be the um, that'll be uh, addressed in the subsequent iteration of this project. We can go out and look at toxicity as a function of contaminants and non-contaminants on a site-specific basis, and we have, in fact, have done that successfully elsewhere in the country. Um, once we determine a relationship between the contaminants, the non-contaminants, and the toxicity responses, we can use that model to predict effect concentrations even at sites or areas within a site where no uh -huh. toxicity tests were conducted. So that's, as Gladys mentioned, when you've got a site that's exceptionally well chemically characterized, you can use that chemical data and predict what the toxicity test responses are. And we did do that for a site, and there was a tremendous uh, reduction in the cost to remediate that site based on the equations that we derived. <clears throat> what we're hoping to do is develop a wide area solution. So we're not only modeling toxicity as a function of the contaminants of potential concern and the non-contaminants, but also the site. What we're hoping to do is develop these models and then test for a site effect. And if there is no site effect, in other words, the toxicity test responses are generally applicable, we'll have a tremendous tool for modifying um, PHC guideline values based on site-specific parameters for non-contaminants. One of the challenges in fitting those models, um, the general sorts of models that I put up on the, the screen earlier, is the, the challenge of multicollinearity. 
Multicollinearity occurs when you're measuring things that are highly related to one another. So it's very difficult at the end of the day when you've got two models that both have terms in them for variables that are highly related to distinguish between one model or the other. And it, it becomes almost an arbitrary decision as to which model to represent. From a numerical or statistical perspective, um, multicollinearity results in um, problems with inverting this matrix. And you need to invert that matrix to solve the, um, the equations for uh, general linear models. And so if you ever use SAS, you'll get a nasty message which just says simply, your matrix is ill-conditioned and it stops. Um, for other, other programs, you'll get the message failure to converge. And it's all because of this. And it's all because the columns of that matrix are related to one another and you cannot get the inverse of that. That's all, that, that's all that's happening. <clears throat> so a solution to that is to reduce the data set, throw away or chop out some of the redundant variables. And the question is, how can you do that objectively or defensively? Uh, one way is to use something called ordination or principal component analysis, which is uh, um, a singular value decomposition of the correlation matrix. It reduces the dimensionality of your explanatory variable matrix and op optimally, it will create synthetic variables that are heuristics. And a heuristic is a tool that allows you to gain insights into your data or insights into a process, and in this case, insights into the uh, mechanisms that drive toxicity. The outcome of data reduction is that you start out with a suite of um, analytes, the contaminants, the non-contaminants, and your site variable, and then after the data reduction, you get rid of some of the non-contaminants because you've pulled out um, some of the redundancies using the ordination. And you can substitute in some of the derived or synthetic variables, the principal components. So we can go from a data matrix that has 15 columns to one that has four by using the data reduction approach. Um, even when you do data reduction, you can still have models which are um, describe the data, or describe the toxicity responses in a similar way. They're both somewhat adequate or very adequate and the challenge becomes how do you choose between those best fitting models? Which one is correct? Particularly, how do you choose between two models when one implicates contaminants and the other one doesn't? What's the objective way of doing that? Oh, there is really no objective way. Um, a better approach is to take the information content of each model and average the parameters and uh, come up with an overall model that considers all the models, the submodels that were fitted. And that's called, um, that process is called model averaging. And one of the big benefits of model averaging over choosing the single best fitting model is that the implicit bias in your standard errors that are due to assuming that you've got the correct model are gone. And that was talked about by Chatfield in 95. Um, model averaging has been around since the mid-90s. Uh, the, the seminal textbook was written on in 2002 and there's been a subsequent textbook since. Um, it's called an information theoretic approach by the people who love to talk about um, information theory and it has some pretty deep roots going back to the 1880s and um, some ideas about how to weigh evidence and that, that those ideas were looked at more recently in the early 70s by a Japanese uh, mathematician called Aka Iki and he came up with an information criterion that allows you to reconcile the differences between what you see and what you expect to see in the optimum and it's, it's exceptionally technical but the bottom line is that it's usable and you can use this model averaging procedure to um, synthesize the information in among several models and you do it objectively. There's no, there's no um, subjectivity in that weighting. The final outcome of model averaging is you can use it to assess the relative importance of variables. And when you're fitting models to a data set that has contaminants and non-contaminants, you want to know how important are the contaminants in, um, in the, uh, the effect that you're seeing. Is it all due to the non-contaminants? So overall, the process has two steps. There's the data reduction step and the model averaging step, and, and I, I refer to them simultaneously as drama. Um, I don't like acronyms, but Gladys had a hideous acronym before, and uh, it was almost obscene. So uh, I changed it. I had, to, I had to make one up, and so I made this one up, drama, to, to talk about the process. 
Um, we had three studies that we looked at. Um, they were contaminated with PHCs. Um, the issues was that one of the sites was co-contaminated with metals. There were different lists of uh, non-COPCs measured because the data sets were never collected for this purpose. Um, there were only three species that were consistently used across the studies and there were some issues with the experimental design which I can talk about later. This graphic shows the results of the principal component analysis. That is the first principal component and the big thing that you could see, should see is that there's some bars that go up and some that go down and there's the, you, you want to look at the few, the few bars that go up that are large and the few bars that, that go down that are large in the absolute sense. And what you'll see uh, on the right hand side of the graphic is you've got a lot of um, soil particle sizes and on the bottom left hand side you've got um, nutrients, water holding capacity and so when I look at this and interpret it from an ecotox eco perspective what it's telling me is that there's a gradient in soil nutrients that is a function of grain size and so if you think about this in really really loose terms you could think about it in terms of um, the ability to grow plants. There were two other, oh I should, should point out that, that that single principal component describes 55 percent of the total variability in the data set and that's 15 non-contaminant variables so I've reduced by by creating that one synthetic variable I can describe 55 percent of the, the non-contaminant variability. Subsequent principal component and principal components describe 25 and 10 percent but the second principal component was not interpretable by me anyways and uh, neither was the third but when I looked at the loading, those are the magnitudes of the bars in those second and third principal components I saw that clay and pH and moisture were predominant they kept popping up so when I did my data reduction I chose the first principal component pH, clay and moisture as explanatory variables and I ignored the remaining um, 11 or four, 12 variables. So I've gone, I've gone from uh, 15 to 4 and one of them is a synthetic variable. Um, also in terms of responses we, there was no single PHC fraction that dominated so I used total PHCs as my response or sorry as another explanatory variable. I used three general model forms. The, they range from most complex to, to, to simplest. The top model allows for the effect of a contaminant or a non-contaminant to vary from site to site. The term S refers to site and the subscript J ranges from 1 to 3 for each of the three sites. The variables are PHC, the first principal component, pH, clay and moisture. Um, the, and going from the most complicated to the simplest model, the last set of models does not allow for any site effects. So what I do is ignore the fact that data were collected from different sites, throw them into a, one bin and analyze them all simultaneously. For each one of those three major classes of models, I chose submodels, which included four explanatory variables, so all possible combinations. So I fitted a total of 17 models to each of the toxicity test responses for the three species. <clears throat> I'm presenting the results for northern wheatgrass. Um, they are better than the results for Isenia, but they are worse than the results for Columbula. So you're getting a fair representation of what the, the data reduction model allergy approach can do. Um, if you look at the first two rows, they represent two different models, simply num numbered one and two, for shoot dry mass for northern wheatgrass and you can, if, you, if you move right over to the right hand side and use the traditional measure of goodness of fit you can see that both of those models fit the data fairly well um, surprisingly well in fact um, but if you look at the degrees of freedom that's an indicator of the number of terms that went into the model both of them have quite a lot, large number of terms especially since they only had five explanatory variables so they're fairly complicated models and yet they describe 84 percent of the data where model averaging really comes into play is how do you choose between model 2 and 1. If you were looking at the R squared value, there's not much difference. If you were looking at um, <clears throat> the degrees of freedom, there's not much difference. A statistician would probably choose this one as the best model. But what's, what is the difference between these two? Is There's three variables that aren't used in this model and how important are they and which ones are they? 
This is where model averaging comes into its own because instead of ignoring or choosing between the two, it averages the values of the parameters. It averages the values of the parameter by an objective weighting, and that's the weighting. So 94% 94% of the weight, or 95% of the weight, is given to the first model, and only uh, the remaining 5% is given to the second model. So in this case, we've got one clearly superior model and one that's not so superior based on an information theoretic criterion, not the R squared. And we're using the, that idea and the, the theory to, to weight the two models in an objective way. We're not relying on model uh, two and ignoring model one. If you look at um, root length, you can see that the W sub i's here are quite small. And that's because the W sub i, these models, none of them are very good at describing root length. Um, and you can see that the R squareds aren't nearly so high. And so what you've got is a bunch of models. I didn't put all the numbers in here, all the different models, because they'd all have to sum to one, and my table would be too long. But the idea is that there are many models that can describe root length equally poorly. And the model averaging approach it, it deals with them all simultaneously. It doesn't force you to pick just the one. <clears throat> the next slide talks about the relative importance of the variables. And so what I've done is um, use the model averaging process and come up with a criterion that talks about the relative importance <coughs> of each variable. So in the first column for shoe dry mass for northern wheatgrass, we can see that the study the effect of study is important. What that means is that the response varied from study to study. We can also see that the effect of hydrocarbons was negligible. So whatever differences there were among sites weren't due to hydrocarbons. They were due to clay, pH, moisture, and uh, the first principal component. And you can, you can spend quite a lot of time looking at this table and come up with all sorts of conclusions, or you can do what I did um, and simply average the relative importances of each variable across all responses and all sites for the two um, toxicity tests that I retained. And you can see that's in this column here. What's interesting is that the most important variable in describing the toxicity test responses, all of them, across all the studies, is the synthetic variable that I created. The synthetic variable that talks about nutrients associated with grain size. It's not hydrocarbons. In fact, hydrocarbons is the second least important variable in describing a toxicity test response. And very surprisingly to me, I wasn't, you know, based on experience, I didn't expect the um, relative importance of the study variable to be so low. It's in fact the least important variable in describing to the toxicity test responses over all the endpoints and over all the three lo the locations that we looked at. So the graphic based on the, the limited data is telling us an important thing is that PHCs aren't the big driver here necessarily, that we may have generalizable responses and that we really need to think about non-contaminants. The benefits of the, uh, the, the drama approach is the, the technical one, that we don't get that dreaded um, um, singularity when we're trying to fit these models, that we circumvent the problem of arbitrary model selection when we've got highly correlated variables, that um, we can summarize the models that describe the data in an objective way using that weighting, and that we correctly deal with the problem of model uncertainty, which is totally ignored by most people. And in fact, it's something that informs that is an important part of risk assessment. Um, Baylor et al. did some work showing that if you don't have if you don't uh, uh, acknowledge that uncertainty, then you're not doing as good a risk assessment as you could. The conclusions based on the analysis of the three data sets is that the non-contaminant variables were always important, and in some cases they were the only important variable. PHCs were not implicated. Overall, PHCs were less important than non-PHCs in explaining the toxicity test responses. <clears throat> Surprisingly, and this is surprising because I went into this project very skeptically, um, and on an overall basis, the results were predictable among sites, suggesting, or at least not precluding, that models may be more broadly applicable. And so that is a really good news story because what we want to do uh, moving forward is to take more data, um, hopefully with standardized toxicity or non-toxicity 
variables and try and apply this over a broad geographic scale. Because if we do, we can, we can do what um, is already implicit in the Tier 1 guidelines, take a number and broadly apply it over a wide geographic range. <clears throat> Recommendations for further work is to improve the experimental designs. The um, experimental designs that are driven by traditional requirement to estimate an EC25 or an EC50 or whatever, um, those sorts of dilution assays and the ideas behind them aren't relevant to assessing toxicity on a contaminant site. We need to do away with uh, laboratory replication and spend more money on analyzing soils and conducting toxicity tests on those soils that are analyzed as opposed to spending money in the toxicity test lab itself. We need to collect additional data. This, this, uh, these results and conclusions are based on three studies that were opportunistically collected. We need to choose sites that represent nodes of the toxicity modifying factor matrix. And by that I mean that if pH is, uh, if you could discretize pH uh, and say that there was a high, medium, low, and discretize another modifying factor like organic matter, and again say it's high, medium, low, we need to go to sites that have, represent all the interstices of that, um, those two vectors, so that we get a good coverage of the range of combinations of these toxicity modifying toxicity modifying factors. We should review the hydrocarbon toxicity data, which uh, would be easier if it was amalgamated into a database, and see what toxicity test responses are sensitive, and which ones are consistent, and which ones are traditionally duds. Um, both Melissa and I had problems with the Isenia data, and uh, I've heard from others that maybe it's maybe not the best thing to use at all times. Another thing that we should do is look at standardizing the list of COPCs and non-COPCs that we looked at. That we look at, um, there's a standard suite of pedologic variables that we should look at and collect and require that be collected when we're doing these ecotox assessments. I'd like to acknowledge the funders of the project: the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and the Explorers and Producers Association of Canada through the Alberta Upstream Petroleum Research Fund. Um, Environment Canada, the PERD program, and the Stantec Consulting Limited Research Fund of 2012.